And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Let me just share a couple of comments about our work. Uh, I started the mission, I started the foundation in uh, 2012 when I uh, retired, sold my investment advisory firm, and, uh, uh, and went right back to work. Uh, this time without compensation, but with uh, something that I've never had so much fun, and that is a dedication to educating investors of all ages. Uh, uh, I, I will be talking to some Western people later today up at, uh, at Bellingham, uh, teach a university class. In fact, we sponsor a university class on personal investing uh, at, at Western. Um, I write for marketwatch.com uh, on the retirement page, and I do a weekly podcast. We try our best to provide the tools and the information that you can make better decisions as an investor. Our, in theory, our work is to help people learn how to do this on your own. And so uh, it, with that in view, it means we have to train people to know the same kinds of things that an investment advisor would know when they're interviewing uh, one of their prospects or a client. The difference is, is all of a sudden the interview is in essence with yourself because as a do-it-yourselfer, you are the client and the advisor all in one. So we want you to know the most important things. And so today I'll be talking about things having to do with the retirement part of life. Uh, and uh, oftentimes I'm talking about the 12 things the first time investor should do in order uh, to be successful. So, uh, uh, and, and I will make this point at the end I certainly am accessible. Not only do I live on Bainbridge, but uh, I, I, Paul at paulmerriman.com is my email, and I do my best to answer questions understanding, please, I am not an advisor. I'm a teacher. That's all I do is I teach, but I'm dedicated, and I'll try my best to help. Now, how to avoid the biggest financial mistakes. I... I, um, I Toy, biggest, most costly, worst. Um, but I'm focusing today on what I consider to be what can be the million dollar mistakes that 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 people make. And so uh, you will have to uh, understand it may be a little different presentation than you're used to in the sense that um, uh, it's really from 30,000 feet, a handful of decisions that you make that, that can cost you and your heirs a lot of money. I just want to mention, a little over a year ago, Reed was kind enough to let me speak uh, with the folks uh, at the uh, Senior Community Center, and I spoke about 12, my favorite 12, Vanguard funds for retirees. I want to thank the 10 people who were there to watch that with me. That was wonderful. And just because we thought others might be interested, we put it on YouTube. We have now between our channel and the channel there at the uh, Senior Center have had over 114,000 opens uh, of that. That is now our number one video. Now, I want to spend a moment and tell you what I tell high school kids and college kids about investing. Because in a way, I'm here to say the same thing to you, but from a different viewpoint. See, the the beauty of the students at the high school and the college students is they have the one thing that the asset that is hard to come by at our ages, and that is they have time uh, that's going to benefit them. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't have anything to invest in many cases, and they also don't have very much knowledge. As a matter of fact, it absolutely astounds me the things that young people believe about investing. The, the one lately that just is so interesting to me is that young people believe that investing in cryptocurrency is less risky than investing in the S&P 500. I just find that fascinating, but that's where they are. They grossly 
underestimate the need for long-term returns. They have a hard time. In fact, when I came into the industry in the mid-60s, I started in 1966. When I came in, it was, it was normal that young people had one dream about money, and that was that someday they'd have a million dollars. It is fascinating to me that when I talk to college students, their one dream is someday they'll have a million dollars. Well, we all know what happened to inflation since 1966 and how far a million dollars, if you had it, would go today. So I'm trying to get to kids and explain to them, believe it or not, you probably need somewhere between three and $10 million, depending on how you're going to live in order to keep up with what you might want to have today. Who knows? We don't know the future. And then they like either to speculate or the other end of that uh, other side of that coin is they don't want to take any risk at all. Something like two out of five millennials have any money in the stock market. I mean, that just astounds me. And it's, and it's sad because I think it's going to cost them over the long run. What I do teach first-time investors that I think is also important to share with you is that an extra half of 1% can be a life changer. If we can find a way to make an extra half of 1%, and my most recent book, We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement, is all about 12 very simple steps that could lead to additional rates of return that would be life changers. And by the way, I make this PDF free, and you can you can literally click, I think, on there and 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 sign up for that book. You can do it later. But the bottom line is, is that if you like that information, you don't have to email people you know and suggest they go to Amazon and buy the book. You can simply send them the PDF of the book, and no salesperson will call. I promise. I make them a guarantee. I'm going to make you a guarantee of sorts as well. But with them, I make that guarantee based on the on, on math, not on the market, but just on math. And I say, if you follow the math, if you invest $6,000 a year, if you earn 8%, if you do that for 40 years and then you retire and for 30 years you make 6% and you take out 4% a year, and if you could make a half of 1% more, that would probably add more than a million dollars to what you have over your lifetime. And I want to show you what I show them, because maybe you'll share it with somebody, uh, a young person that would benefit from this. But here's the bottom line. If you do make 8% during the accumulation and you do take out 4% of a 6% return in retirement, you will between, then let me get my highlighter going here because I want to point to this. between. The money that you have at the end of your life, and we assume 90, age 95, and uh, the money that you take out during your retirement, that total value is about $5.5 million. But if we could find an extra half of 1%, that number would be $7 million, $1.5 million dollars more just because you found an extra half of 1%, which should, if people have any curiosity at all, start the question, how can I make an extra half of 1%? Well, here's the beauty. It's easy. And here's what I know about retirees. I've got to look at it in a different way than I do with the first-time investor, because you have less time and more money. You are really focused on not wanting to lose your savings, and you know a lot more about the investing process. But I still believe an extra one half a percent for you can be a life changer. By the way, it may not be a life changer for you, because you may have more than you need. And what it really is about is leaving more to children and charities. And let that be a life changer for somebody else. But I think that is absolutely doable. So here's what I teach retirees. One, 
that instead of making up numbers of eight and, and six and four percent, I mean, all these just using the straight math, let's take a look at the past. Let's make the make learn the lesson not from a, a, a given accumulation and distribution rate of return, et cetera. Let's look at the actual history that happened and what would have happened to your money if you had been there and made the decision to retire and take out a certain amount and have a certain combination of stocks and bonds in your portfolio. We can do that now. And we all know intuitively there is no risk in the past. And that whatever I'm going to show you, I know it worked, okay? I mean, this is the problem with your source of information about investing. Nobody shows you the things that don't work. They only show you the things that did work. Well, it's pretty obvious, but I'm doing it with index funds and asset classes, not special managers or special information. You'll see it in a minute, but here's what I know. There are many ways to make an extra half of 1%, even when you're retired. And interestingly enough, and not a surprise to you, there are many ways to lose a half a percent if you make the wrong decisions. Now, I talked about, about, uh, uh, about numbers and using numbers uh, rather than graphs. I'm a great believer in numbers. I am not asking you to read these numbers. I am asking you to simply notice that on the left, we have the calendar years from 1970 through 2021. And then every column, it represents the year-by-year -year return with some combination of equities and fixed income, bonds. And so the first column we come to, headed bonds, you can see the returns over this 52-year period. And you can see down at the bottom, the compound rate of return of over 7%. Okay, where do you get 7% with bonds today? You don't, as you know. Not even high-yield bonds are paying 7%. Well, there might be a few but those would be very, very risky high yield bonds. But the bottom line is that that's what did happen over this 52 year period. And we don't know what the future will bring. I suspect many of us thought we'd never see 7% inflation again. We thought somehow that we learned how to control those kind of things. And look what we're facing today. As you move to the right on this table, as we move from column to column, we are adding 10% equities. And I got a whole bunch of these tables. And in every case, the equities are represented by something different. In this particular case, it's the S&P 500 one year at a time. So what do I know about the S&P 500? If I look at the bottom line, it had an 11% compound rate of return. And you may be thinking, whoa, that's awfully high. Well, actually, that is the average 40-year return of the S&P 500 since 1928. The very best was 12.5. The very worst was 8.9. But the average was 11. So that is interesting to me here that as we follow the bouncing ball, moving and adding more equity, every time we add more equity, we add more return. And it's about a half a percent. So you go uh, originally from 7.1 to 7.6 by putting 10% in equities. You go from 7.6 to 8.1 by putting another 10%. And every time you do that, not only do you historically get a better rate of return, but you have the opportunity to lose more money. And we show you here how much you would have lost. What would the worst 12 months have looked like? What would the worst three years, the worst five years look like? So you can get a sense of what might happen to you during the rest of your life. I'm 78. I probably, it's possible we'll never see a huge decline like what happened from 1929 to 1938. Oh, by the way, 
I have been through another decline like that because the decline from 2000 to 2009 was a greater decline than what happened from 1929 to 1938. So many of us in this room today have, in fact, been through one of the worst decades in stock market history. And uh, it's possible our memories aren't the same as what happened 29 to 38 because so few of us ended up in a soup line. But you can see there are lessons here for people to learn, but I wanna go to where you can see the numbers. You can see the numbers easily here. These are the numbers at the bottom of the page. So I wanna talk about 50-50. I'll talk a lot about 50-50 because that's what my wife and I have. And I'm comfortable with it. I know what to expect out of 50-50. And since I'm 78, and I'll probably, if I live another 12 years, I mean, it's a miracle. If it were not for prescription drugs, I would not be here today because I have not done it by working out and staying and eating, right? It's what keeps many of us going is they found ways to extend our lives. If I can get another 10 years, that would be amazing. That would be a blessing. And so I don't know what's going to happen over the next 10 years. But I know at least looking backwards that I better be ready to lose 25% of our portfolio. And I find a lot of people aren't willing to lose 25% of their money. And maybe they're optimistic and believing that bear markets aren't going to come tap them on the shoulder. So what do you do? You move to the left until you find an amount of risk you're willing to take and then find out if the return you get along with that amount of risk makes any sense. And this is when you are an investment advisor to yourself. You've got to be dealing with. You're negotiating with yourself to find that right balance. Oftentimes, you're negotiating with a spouse to find that right balance. But I love this information because it gives me a sense of that relationship between risk and return. The problem is... What kind of return can we expect for the rest of our life? Well, of course, the answer is nobody knows. Nobody even knows what next week is going to bring. It is all unknowable. You could say, well, yeah, but I have a, an idea of the range. Yes, we have an idea of a range that what is reasonable, but we know something different could happen. So in looking at those returns, if I'm playing the role of advisor to myself, I would say, hmm, I wonder how I would do if instead of getting a 9.4% compound rate of return, what if I got 2% less? What if I got 3% less? And here's the cool thing. Because of a young man at Amazon who learned how to invest from our website, he took all of our data and built a lifetime investment port, um, calculator that anybody can go in and adjust what rate of return that you want to assume. 2% less, 3% less, whatever you, half a percent less, doesn't matter. You can see how it moves things around. Now, I just showed you a way you could make a half a percent more, and that is have 10% more in equities will probably give you a legitimate shot at an extra half of 1%. But let me tell you, it's easy to find ways to add an extra half of 1%. Uh, they're, they're basically all found in, in my free, free book about we're talking millions. One is the operating expense of a mutual fund. Did you know the average operating expense, ex, uh, expense of a mutual fund, equity I'm talking now, is 0.9, almost 1% a year. When you can go pick up an index fund for half, in fact, four one hundredths of 1%. And understand the academics tell us if there's anything that in essence guarantees us a better rate of return in the future, it is to have lower expenses. And by the way, for, the, for those of you who are do-it-yourself investors, you are not charging your one, yourself 1% 1 for investment advice. You're giving it to yourself for nothing. And so that happens to have a big impact 
on what you're going to leave to others, just like lower expenses are. And then there is paying a load to buy a mutual fund or buying a low load fund. Well, load funds charge for equities 5.75 generally. When I came into the industry, it was eight and a half. So they've come down, but not enough. But that's going to cost you about a half of 1% historically in the future. Then, of course, there's the turnover inside of actively managed funds. A lot of people may not know that only about one in 20 mutual funds are able to beat the indexes themselves over a 20-year period. And here's the threatening news. Those actively managed funds, a few of them do beat the index, okay? It's not very many, and nobody knows how to pick them, but they do. Maybe it's luck, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a genius uh, at the helm. But if you look at how the rest of them do, please understand that when we go down to the 50th percentile and the 75th percentile, we go down in the performance that the compound rate of return can be as much as 2 to 5% a year difference from the benchmark index itself. And when you're in an actively managed fund, you are taking the risk. And of course, you know, I don't have 20 years. So the, 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 the damage would be done to my portfolio is not going to be as great. But I don't want to choose that as the outcome if I legitimately have another choice. And then another thing a lot of people don't know, you can find it out on Morningstar. You can go to any mutual fund. You can go to what is called the uh, price tab. And underneath the price tab, it will show you, according to Morningstar, the cost per year over the last three years of the taxes you would pay and reduce the return that you would have gotten in that fund versus the average fund. I will just tell you the average fund over the last three years, equity fund, has, has, has had about a 1.6% lower rate of return because of taxes. By the way, the assumption is it's at the highest tax rate. So if you're at a lower tax rate, the damage would be, wouldn't be as much. But this is what we're comparing. So if you made 10% and, and, and you reported the taxes, this doesn't mean it be, because, you, because you sold the fund. It's the distributions that you have to deal with and the tax that you get charged for having made those distributions. Here's what we know. Then it, in, it, instead of making about 8.4%, after you take off the 1.6, with the index, talking about the S&P 500, you would have made about 9.6%. There again is a half a percent. And here's the thing that really bothers me. Legitimate people, people whether they're uh, following religious beliefs or people following their best beliefs, however they get there, and I, and I guess the ones that irritate me a little more are the ones who, who, who shelter or, or uh, the, uh, preach how, how good investing can be. Some of those people give advice that will give you information and recommendations to be wrong on every one of these. They will say it's good to buy a load fund. They will say it's good to buy an actively managed fund. I mean, that irritates me, which is one of the reasons that I am so aggressive and outspoken about this, that you have the ability in every one of these cases to keep it in your family and not somebody else's. And you can say, well, but I've got an advisor. I, I, I've got to pay them. Okay, okay, that's fine. I've got an advisor too, okay? And there's a very specific reason I have an advisor. And it's not because I don't understand how all this stuff works. But yes, I have an advisor. But is my advisor using actively managed funds or index funds? You know. Is my advisor 
recommending funds that have high expenses or low expenses. You know. Tax efficient, you know. As a matter of fact, one of the fascinating things about investing today versus when I started in 1966 is it has never been more efficient or more profitable to invest. As long as you get it right, they have made it a piece of cake. And this is the beauty. If I can get young people counting to stop counting on cryptocurrency and meme stocks, I think I can help them make a lot more money than I ever made because the industry actually allows us today to make it. It's one of the ways you can make more. And a lot of people may not know this. The day-to-day -day volatility in the stock market is really amazing. And when I say really amazing, it's not just that it goes up and down a lot, because if you follow the S&P 500, you know, you know there are some days that it can be up and down 1%. And that's a lot in one day. If you annualized your return and you made 1% every day or you lost 1% every day, you'd have either a great profit or a serious problem. Well, the good news is about 47% of the days, the market is down and 53% of the days, the market is up. But notice this. This happened on March 25th, 2022. The market was up or down? Well, if you're in the S&P 500, it was probably because it's a balance. It's a core fund. It has some value and it has some growth. And it was up three-tenths of 1%. But if you were one of those, in one of those great hot dog funds that was all growth, you were down 1%. And if you were in a large company, of out of favor companies, the value funds and stocks, you were up 1%. Oh, and if you were in small companies that were out of favor, you were up 1.7%. And if you were in small companies that were, uh, that were very popular, but they were down 1% that day, you lost money. This, believe it or not, it's not unusual. And so you might hear somebody saying, God, it was a terrible day. And you look at your portfolio because so many people, particularly retirees who like dividend companies, have got a fair amount of value in their portfolio and probably did okay. But the reason I bring this up is that one of the mistakes that we make as investors is we don't diversify enough. But you could say, well, wait a minute. I got the total market index, or I got the S&P 500. I am well diversified. Well, actually what you have is a portfolio that is largely driven by about 50 large growth companies. It's not the value companies that are driving the S&P 500. It's that handful of companies. In fact, I, I think the top 25% is about 33% or 30, 33 to 40% of, of that portfolio is represented by that small number of companies. Bottom line is all of history shows us that you are better off diversifying beyond just 500 stocks or beyond 3,500 stocks you might have in the total market index. But here's what we know from 1928 to 2021. We know that large companies, this would basically be the S&P 500, compounded at 10.2%. We know large cap value out of favor companies, riskier, get a higher return historically, up another percent, 11.2. We know that small companies, by the way, these big companies, these, well, the S&P 500, the average size companies, $300 billion or more. These companies are three, four, $5 billion. They're much smaller. Ah, riskier, therefore, yes. And it's easy to see that they're riskier because they 
go up and down with a wider uh, amount of, of volatility. And then we have small cap value, really the gold ring historically of, of return. And it's interesting because other than for the period during the depression, uh, the losses with small cap value have not been much higher than with the S&P 500. But the depression was a killer. Here's what I know. If you take these four equity asset classes and just simply put 25% in each one of those, you would have had what we call the four fund combo. You would have had an 11.9% compound rate of return. Well, let's see what that looks like. By the way, for you to look out at later, if you wish, notice here are the 80, 15 year periods. So here's what we know the range of returns have been over the average best and worst 15 year periods. Here's how it's been over the average and worst and best 40 years. So you can see, if you wish, that range of exposure to risk and return. And by the way, notice once we get out to 40 years that the average return is not 10.2%, but 11. I mentioned that earlier. And 13.5 for large cap value, 13.7 for small cap blend, 16.2 for small cap value, and for the average for the four fund portfolio, 13.7. That's the past. There is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. Living in the Seattle area for most of my adult life, I should have put $10,000 into Microsoft and never touched it, right? We always know what we should have done. Question is, what are we going to do? Well, let me show you something. I want to show you the impact of combining these four portfolios. Daryl Balls, uh, our director of analytics, uh, another uh, volunteer to our foundation. Uh, Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls. Chris is the director of research. These people are so valuable to our students because they take the past and find ways to share it in a way that we hope is memorable because that's our problem. We are in your life for a few minutes and then we're gone. We do not call you. We do not email you and ask you what you're doing or could we help you. No, we are just teachers who show you what we know and then we're gone. We hope you'll subscribe to our free newsletter and be a regular visitor to our site because there's more information to come, we believe. But here's what I know about this piece, and it is a masterful tool to teach. This shows me four different asset classes, the S&P 500, green, large cap value, dirty yellow, tan, small cap blend, brown, small cap value, electric blue, and then the purple four fund combo. I can look at it from 30,000 feet, or I can get right down inside of it and look at it close. I can show it to you very close here. And every year tells me a story. I can learn so much from reading this like a book. Because in essence, 1997 is a page out of my book. I should say Daryl's book. And in 1997, the returns of small cap value, 39.2%. This is an index done by academics. This is not actively managed uh, investment. Just buy everything that qualified for small cap value. Large cap value, up 38.4. That tells me, since both large and small did well that year, I'm sorry, yes, did well, and they're both value, that that was a great year for value. 
Well, it wasn't that great because as I looked down at the bottom, the S&P 500 was up 33.4 and the small cap blend was up 29.1. So I don't know anybody who was com complaining because their asset class didn't do well. But I do like the four fund combo. By the way, one thing I know about the four fund combo, it will never be number one ever. Impossible. And it will never be number four or number five, impossible, because it's the average of all four. It's going to be somewhere around the middle. It might be a little towards the top, a little towards the bottom, but I should never be able to complain in a big way about what it did compared to what other people did. But you may find it kind of surprising that in 1998, the S&P 500 skyrockets 28.6. Wait a minute. We expect the S&P 500 to be the worst performing equity asset class because it's the highest quality. If I put bonds in here, and I will in a minute, if I put bonds in here, we expect because bonds are less risky that they will give lower rates of return. And generally that's absolutely true, but not in 1998. It was part of a five-year period. 99, 95 to 99, that the S&P 500 compounded at about 28.6% for five years. People just said, why do I need anything else? Because people have a tendency to put way too much dependence on something that just happened. It's just human nature does this to us. Notice what came in number two, another large asset class, large cap value, way beyond uh, underneath the, the large cap blend at 8.4%. Look at small cap value. S&P is up 28.6, small cap values down 5.2. How are you feeling now when at the end of 1997, you thought you found something really special and put money into small cap value? The next year, 1999, the story continues. What we find as we turn the page is small did better than large at, at the top, but the difference is, is, is minuscule. But in both cases, because they're driven by growth more than they are, these are blends of growth and value, but growth has way more importance, as I mentioned before, than does the value. And so that tells me that probably the value companies didn't do as well. And guess what? They didn't do as well. They made about one third as much as those two star performers. And the four fund just did what it does, somewhere close to the middle. And then 2000 comes along. You may remember 2000 as a really bad year because the S&P 500 was down 9.1. Well, small cap value had a wonderful year. And for what it's worth, in about 1994, our firm started using dimensional funds, an index, a mutual, a family of index mutual funds. And it was from the DFA people, Dr. Fama and Dr. French, the academics, that I learned about this idea of putting together all these different asset classes. I don't have one original idea in my mind. I have simply learned from others, and I'm sharing it as every teacher does. And this is what I learned. But it's also what we applied to our clients' accounts. How do you think we looked to our clients at the end of 2000, when the S&P 500, which had just finished a series of years that made them look like the only thing you'd ever want to invest in. And we had been telling people, don't trust it because that's not what we know from the past. And it worked. And it, our business exploded. We, we just got more, I mean, we, it's just amazing how many people came to us and said, oh, we like what you're doing. Well, why did they like what we're doing? Because it had recently been working. And our position was, this is not about something working recently. I don't want you to invest because something worked recently. That's bad historically. I want something 
that says that you should have a better return with less volatility by diversifying beyond what you might be doing now. And by the way, if I go back here, I can see periods, look at there, all of these years from 1940 to 1945, the S&P 500, it's not a dog, it's where it was supposed to be. And small cap value is kind of up there where it's supposed to be. Except then when we come back to what we know recently from 2014, with the exception of 2016, the S&P 500 is up there where it's not supposed to be. But that is in essence wrong. It is supposed to be there part of the time. That's what we know about the stock market. And all I'm saying is an easier way to address this is for people, and I'm thinking of young people who don't want to take a lot of risk. They'd like to go to the S&P 500. If they're going to go into equities at all, I'm saying, have you considered the four fund strategy? And by the way, if I only have 10 years left, I'm going to go back for a second and look at the last 10 years, starting with 1930, the decade. In here, by the way, we have bonds as well. But I want you to notice what happened during 1930 to 1939. The S&P 500 is down one-tenth of 1% 1 a year. And that's before inflation. It was up because it was a period of deflation. Four fun combos right there. Looking almost like it. And then from 1940 to 49, four fun combo up 14.3, S&P up 9.2. 50 to 59, four fund combo up 19.4, S&P 500 up 19.4, doesn't matter. Then the next, the next decade, S&P 500, 7.8, four fund combo, 11.3, four fund combo, 70 to 79, 10.6, S&P 500, 5.9. Then the S&P 500 does something that it hadn't done before. It goes right to the top from 1990 to 99 and from 2010 to 2019. But look where four fun combo, it's tucked in right underneath it. So it says to me that I got a chance to do better with the four fun combo. But when I don't, I'm probably not going to be terribly disappointed. Now, having said that, the market almost guarantees that's going to find a way to disappoint you, okay? That's the history of the stock market. So, I want to show you ever so briefly that table, that fine-tuning table, not the S&P 500, but we're looking here at the four fund combo instead of the S&P 500. That's what the 100% equity is. And I can look at the 50-50. The S&P 500 was up, up, was up 9.4% in the first table we looked at. Here, it's 10.2%. Now, I know I, I can't put the word guaranteed next to that because there will be, obviously, periods that the S&P 500 is a better place to be. And by the way, if that's where your comfort is, is the S&P 500 and the idea of diversifying amongst four equity asset classes is uncomfortable, you are more likely to stay the course with what is comfortable. The question is, can you find comfort in something else? Well, that's a question that's been on the table since 1976 when John Bogle brought out the S&P 500 because I can tell you when they brought it to the public, they expected they were going to raise $150 million. They raised $11 million because nobody almost was comfortable with the idea of what the S&P 500 was. In fact, the public didn't really buy into the S&P 500 until about 1999, because at the end of that 25-year period, it had compounded at over 17%, and guess what happened next? From 2000 until today, it's about a 7.5% a year compound rate of return. 
But I do notice it's the same story when you add more of whatever that equity asset class is, as you add more, the return goes up. Distributions, more numbers. And for those who like these numbers, you're going to find this great fun. And at the end of this presentation, I'll have a link to where you can find dozens and dozens of these tables. But here's what's important about this table. It assumes that in 1970, you had a million dollars and you retired. It assumes that you put the equity portion in the S&P 500 and you put the bond portion, you had the bond portion at the other side of the table. So that over here in this first column, it showed you what happened to 100% in bonds. It assumed you were taking out $30,000 a year, basically 3% of that original amount. It assumed that every year as inflation went up, you increased the amount of the distribution. So you can see, how would you have done? How At the end of 20 years, how much money would you have had having been purely in bonds? Three million dollars, more than three, three and a half. What about if you were 50-50? You, you would have about 4.6. Excuse me, I'm 23. Yeah, 4.4 million. Pardon me. Now, um, was it worth the risk to, to make that extra money? Well, it's easy to say it was afterwards, but I can tell you particularly people who were looking at the S&P 500, 100% in equities, you were down at one point a lot. That may have been very uncomfortable. And given that that was a part of your portfolio, you may not have been so comfortable being 50-50. The good news is bonds were paying you high returns. I want to show you a big decision. In this next page, all I do is I change from $30,000 distribution to $40,000 because we wanted to spend more, of course. We wanted to spend more, particularly when we were young in our retirement. But I want you to see that if you spent 40,000 instead of 30 and you upped it by inflation, instead of having 4 million left over at the end of 20 years, it's 2.6 million. It's okay, that's still good. But if you wanted to take the next layer of risk, and take $50,000 out, you got yourself a problem. You see it? Particularly if you are what they call a member of the FIRE movement, where you're retiring at a young age and planning to live off the money for the rest of your life. But, you know, it was okay. You had money left after 20 years. But what if we use the, the four funds instead of $4 million, $6 million? What if we took out 40,000 instead of 2.6, 4.3 million? Instead of almost going broke, you not only have 2.6 million at the end of that 20 years, but it lasts for the next. And that's because, not because you took out more money, the only thing you changed was the equity asset class. But there's another way to do it. And it's what my wife and I do as the approach. We oversaved, so we had more money than we needed. So, and I'm going to just take you ever so quickly to the 5% strategy. Because that's how much we've been taking out. And we're right on the verge of thinking about 6%. How could we be so aggressive? because we saved sufficiently more than we needed that we didn't have to worry about increasing the amount because of inflation. But what we did was, instead of starting with some amount and every year upping it for inflation, we simply took 5% of what the year and the previous year end balance was, and that's our money for this year. We are right now living on 5% of what we had for retirement at the end of last year. And here's what that does. When the market's going down, it puts the brakes on. Can't take quite as much out because you got less money. And that makes me feel good because I'm the scaredy cat in our family. And I'm also the frugal one. 
The good news is my wife's not a scaredy cat, and she enjoys spending money much more than I do. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But so when the market goes up, she gets rewarded. But when the market goes down, I give, I'm given a, a feeling of more safety and doing something to defend against the bad times. And that is simply taking less because look what happens. Remember before when you took out 5% and you upped it by inflation, you ran out of money partway down the column. Now, right here, this is the 50-50 column. You don't run out of money. And the only reason you don't is because you have changed the distribution strategy. Okay. I know I'm running out of time, Reed, so I'm going to mention one more time the financial education's lifetime investment calculator. It's free. And and for people who, who like to play with the numbers, I hope you find it as much fun as uh, those of our followers that like that kind of stuff. But I want to spend a moment and I want to talk on some other big decisions. When you retire, I've all, I, I just got done talking about the difference between retiring with enough and retiring with more than enough. That's a huge decision because it is, it, it gives a lot more sense of security, it does to me, to retire with more than I need rather than retiring with, oh my God, I hate what I'm doing. I got to get out of here right now. And do I have enough? And somebody will, will bless you and say you have enough. Now, you got to be careful because so often those people who bless you and say you have enough are also in the business of waiting for you to roll over your 401k into a privately managed account so they can start earning some money on it along with you. Sometimes I have seen situations where somebody said you had enough that through my eyes, no, it was not enough. And that's why I think it's always good to get that second opinion. When we start taking Social Security, we all know that's a big deal. And if you have any question about that, I hope you'll join me on uh, the 21st of April with Mary Beth Franklin. Whether you spend your taxable money first or your tax deferred money, I, I, absolutely, that's a, that, that is a, a, a big decision. It's not a million dollar decision, but most people say taxable first. How much we take out and when we spend our savings and how much and when we give it away. A lot of people give away too much too quickly. I mean, I'm more than happy to leave my IRA to our foundation. Happy to do that. I don't want to give it all to them now. I, I, I'm just, I, I want to wait. I want to wait to do that because I want to make sure I got enough. And whether you sell equities or fixed income uh, securities first, th those are big decisions. And I, I'm going to recommend a book in just a second. When do we pass risk to others? I, as I mentioned earlier, sold the firm in 2012. I will never have a chance to make as much money on the, the value of my investment as I would in that firm because it's a business. And when you have passive investments, you don't expect to make as much as you do uh, when you have active, something that, 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 you, you, that you are directly involved with. But I see a lot of people that carry the, the risk of that too long. I really believe that, uh, at least for us, uh, it is important to pass that baton of risk to somebody else. A lot of people have all their money in one stock. I think that can be a huge mistake. And how much risk should we take when we have enough? I run into a lot of people who are in their, uh, let's say they're 60, and they're going to retire in five years. They have plenty of money to retire right now. I will ask the question, or I did when I was an advisor, do you want to continue to take the risk of not having enough when you have enough? Doesn't mean you can't keep working, but sometimes it makes sense to reduce that risk, lock it in, guarantee, I, mean, I love the word guarantee. We never know that you can, but at least you can know the odds are more in your favor and professional help. 
I really encourage every investor to stop before they retire and have somebody look at their plan. I'm not talking about hiring somebody at 1% a year. Get somebody by the hour. And then I want to address ever so briefly the threat, the threat of elder abuse financially. I've seen it many times. I want to recommend a book written by Larry Swedrow, Your Complete Guide to a Successful, Secure Retirement. I am sure there are some people on the, uh, the, the Zoom call here who have read this. It's one of the finest books that I've read in terms of information for soon to be retired or retired people. I called up Larry and the publisher and I said, please, I love what you've done on elder abuse. Would you please let us share that uh, that chapter uh, with the people who are coming and they and they agreed to. And I agreed also that I would show you the table of contents so that if you do in fact buy that book, and I promise I make not I make nothing on this book except that I believe you'll be uh, emotionally and intellectually ready to take on more decisions uh, with Larry's help. Remember I said I am not a financial advisor. I'm an investment guy. There's our book, and you can get that free. And here's a book that was written by Chris Pedersen, who is our uh, director of, uh, uh, of uh, this is one of those things, um, doesn't matter what he's the director of. He's a brilliant guy. He's the one who came up with the idea of Two Funds for Life. It's one of the greatest ideas for young people I, I've ever seen. Director of research, by the way our website, and here are those links to all of those places you can find 150 to 200 uh, different, uh, 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 different tables. It's great, including, by the way, our ETF and mutual fund recommendations. So there you go. I've, I've spoke faster and longer maybe than uh, some would like, but uh, Reed, do we have time for some questions? Yes, and although I did not send out your... Um your PDF before ah. this meeting, I will send it out after. So you'll oh, get Oh, great, it. thanks. That's great. So I, if anyone has a question, I would say just uh, open up your microphone, be polite and uh, take your turn. Just ask one at a time so that other people get a chance if they have a question. You go ahead and call them. Why did you do that? Okay. So I don't see anybody raising their hand, but oh, uh, <laughs> oh that's easy. That's, a that's good. good. <laughs> well, I can take the stop share off then. I think. Okay. I'll, because I don't have to read. What was the, what was the name of the book again? Ah, oh, you're successful. First of all, Larry Swedro, S W E D R O E, and I don't have my copy right here, and it's in the handout material. But it's it's about a it's a successful guide to retirement decisions. It's what it's about. Thank but you. But if you go to he has written I think fifteen books. He is a terrific educator, and he knows all of the numbers from financial planning, estate planning, and all of those things. I think that are important to you. I thought that one of the things that uh, was most evident in what you were talking about today was the value of. Um, it's never too late to, to balance uh, risk and reward, that we can keep doing that even as we, uh, in a moderate or conservative way, take out uh, income uh, when we're retired. You know something, that's, I think that's a great point. And, and what we need to believe, I think, is that there's going to be a reward for having made the effort to analyze that. And, and uh, for some people, you think, oh, God, how can I face all of these decisions? First of all, <laughs> it's almost one decision at a time, each fork in the road. If you take them one at a time, big versus small, value versus growth, stocks versus bonds, mutual funds versus individual, load versus no load, high expenses versus low expenses. They're all easy decisions if you don't try to make them all at one time. Hey Paul, just, this, yes. this, it's Jane here. Just Hi, Jane. Yes. Uh, 
a really quick in the since I'm a numbers person at the very bottom of that like massive number sheet you had was something called um, worst drawdown. drawdown. Yes. I'm just I'm curious what that is. Okay. So you got the market bouncing back and forth and we can judge quarter, three months, six months, 12 months, 36 and 60 months. Easy to measure that and easy to kind of understand it. Those all have to do with losses, but the drawdown is from the last peak down to the bottom before it turns around and works its way back up. Okay, so it's that snapshot in time where you go, oh my God. Yes. Right. Yeah. And sometimes that's that, the that, moment you want to jump, right? Well, and what happens is in 1987, there was this 22.5% loss in one day. Yes. And had that happened over a week or two, a lot of people would have jumped. A lot of people did jump, by the way, on that day. But a lot of people stayed the course because it very quickly came back up. Right. But it doesn't always record that quickly. Sometimes it takes years to get back to where you were. It took Microsoft from 1990, 16 years to break, I'm sorry, 2000, 16 years to break even again. That's a long time. And if you bought Microsoft at the peak, waiting 16 years to break even was not what you had in mind. And so that drawdown, we think, is important. And both, you'll notice 50% is kind of the number you see down there a lot when you look at a lot of these drawdown tables, particularly with the all equity portion. Uh, Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch, you know, two great advisors and investors, both said, if you're not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't be in the stock market. It doesn't make any sense to go in the stock market because Warren Buffett has lost 1988 and 89. There was a 12 month period. He lost half of his money. And yet he was the man who said rule number one, don't lose. Rule number two is don't forget rule number one. And yet he lost half of his money. Well, he wasn't talking about don't lose for a year, but invest in things that if you had to wait 10 years, that you would be willing to do that. And, uh, and so there, there's a lot to successful investing and philosophy or trust. And by the way, this is a faith-based industry. It is as much a faith-based industry as almost any I know. I said almost. Um, because you don't know the future. Nobody does. But just on like any other faith-based industry, there are people who will tell you what the future is going to be. And they'd say it to you like they know. And maybe they believe that they know, but we know they can't know. Or at least we believe they can't know because maybe they are special. Um, Paul, I have a question. Um, yes. You haven't mentioned ETFs. Oh, yes. Well, exchange traded funds and mutual funds are basically the same in that they represent a, port, a broadly diversified portfolio of securities. Okay, That's where we start. Now, what's different is ETFs can be traded during the day, during the market, while the market is open. You can't do that with a mutual fund. You have to wait till the end of the day. And when you buy and sell an ETF, you are buying on the, on the ask price, and you're selling at the bid price, that difference is called the spread. That's mm -hmm. Let's call it the wholesale markup in the industry. When you buy and sell mutual funds at the end of the day, there is no spread. Everybody gets the same price. ETF is more tax efficient. And so for people in a taxable account, an ETF will over the long, as a matter of fact, Vanguard is in a long-term project of trying to get most of their clients to go over to ETFs because they're more tax efficient. And we have uh, 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 we have a, the best in class ETFs recommendations because ETFs come from all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of firms offer ETFs. Chris Patterson has looked through virtually all of them to pick 
the best small cap value, the best large cap value, the best large cap blend, et, et cetera, to build a portfolio. And guess what? I said earlier that it's never been more efficient it's in terms of, for us as investors, you can now buy and sell ETFs. Not You still have to pay the spread, but there's no commission at Vanguard, at Fidelity, at Schwab. And you could even go to Fidelity today and buy a mutual fund that looks like the S&P 500 with no operating expense, none. Oh, yeah. And they're still making a profit. What do you think that says about the industry? What does that say about those of us who are smart enough to know what's going on, how we could likely make more money? Not because we found any secrets or we found a good company to buy, but we found out how to control those things that we can control. And then we have to leave the rest of it to whatever the outcome is. So can I just do a follow-up there? So it sounded to me like the, um, the biggest advantage for looking at ETFs rather than mutual funds is the tax consequences. Correct. That is the biggest uh, advantage. The big disadvantage is it makes it possible, easy for people to trade the market with indexes. Uh, and and I'm, I'm happy that makes them happy. Uh, <laughs> I'm unhappy that it's likely to lead to lower returns in the long run than they're likely to get. And they will have, in most cases, taken more risk because they do tend to, to, to chase performance. And they, and they also find it very difficult to be a master market timer. It is so easy to be a master buy and holder. It is almost impossible to be a master market timer. And I, and I know that intimately because I have followed market timing since 1966. And I know that I know the problems with market timing emotionally. There is no more difficult emotional strategy in the business than market timing. Buy and hold works for most people, but not everybody can buy and hold. It's our job to be educated, and that is why at Western Washington University, I underwrote, uh, the, our foundation underwrote a class that has been full every quarter since 2013 when it was approved, and now I am working with that school to have a financial literacy program for every student who comes through Western. Every student will know what an index fund is, will know what a load, I mean, they are hopefully going to know and we're going to change the future of a lot of people because you can't believe how many of those young students at Western are the first generation college graduate coming along. And they're taking this information home to their parents. It's unbelievably exciting. Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.